September 9th, 2020, regular board meeting to order at 3 p.m. We live and go to school in a city that is the ancestral homeland to the Duwamish people, the Muckleshoot Nation, and the Suquamish Nation. We acknowledge them as custodians of this land since time immemorial. As guests, and in many of our cases, as settlers on this land, we extend our deepest gratitude and respect to their ancestors and elders, past, present, and future. Ms. Wilson-Jones, um, the roll call, please. Director Hampton. Here. Director Harris. Present. Director Hersey. Here. Director Mack. Here. Director Rankin. Here. Director Rivera-Smith. Present. Director DeWolf. Here. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Yeah. Superintendent Janot is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. This meeting is being held remotely through the governor's proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. The public is being provided remote access today by phone and through SPS TV by broadcast and streaming on YouTube. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. With that, I will now turn it over to Superintendent Janot for her comments. Okay, thank you, uh, President DeWolf. Appreciate everybody being here and engaging. Um, so start of school happened and things are rolling. As you all know, we started last Friday and we are tracking numbers of logins and such. And, you know, we do have a strong start that is going that will continue the rest of this week where we have asked our educators and our principals to make sure that we are building relationships, getting uh, students set up with tech, making sure that everybody knows how to log on. You all know that the first day Friday, we had a few technical glitches. Our DOTS teams worked around the clock to make sure that uh, we were getting better at bandwidth and other things. They provided updates over the weekend to SPS devices. Um, so things went a little more smoothly uh, yesterday. And I think as we continue to build this system um, of remote learning and working the kinks out that we will be able to provide a quality education to our students, no matter the circumstances. As you all know, that there is a lot of anxiety that comes with everything that everybody's dealing with right now. And so, you know, also recognizing that there is a human element to all of this and our families are, you know, trying to work out their own systems of working remotely, of uh, having to be, uh, set routines and schedules at their own home, our teachers and our educators also dealing with all these issues at home and often have their own families to provide education to. And so just recognizing that everybody is doing the best they can, that we continue to build the systems that are going to be necessary to provide a quality remote learning system. Um, we did have some technical issues I was in, I've been in schools where, you know, devices are still getting rolled out. Um, people are still coming to enroll in our system. So at John Stanford, our enrollment center is open for this week for those families that, um, you know, are in the habit of having access to in-person and translation and stuff. And so that's important for the word to get out that, you know, enrollment office is open at John Stanford, taking all the health protocols and putting those in place, of course, um, allowing only so many people into the building at a time, um, along with all the sign-in and things that need to happen. And so um, contacting families, contacting students are still continuing. Yesterday, we only had 25,680 logons. And so, you know, identifying who still needs to be tracked down What's the reason for not logging on? Is it a technical issue? Is it because there still needs to be devices? Um, so all of those things still being worked out for this week, but just wanted to point out that things are rolling. School did start. Um, 
people are logging on and we're still fixing the system as concerns come up. And as I've been telling everybody, the name of the game this year is really going to be patience and flexibility. Um, that's, I think, going to be the mode that we have to be in for as long as we're in dealing with this crisis. So I just want to kind of run through a few uh, little updates from this week. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, launch of the 2020-21 school year, um, not like any other in history. I just really want to give a huge shout out to the Department of uh, Technology staff. Some are pictured here. They toured the city. Uh, we partnered with Seattle Housing Authority and they handed out hotspots. They did a lot of troubleshooting with families, provided free internet uh, for where we were able to. And just really want to thank our partners, Comcast, Amazon, and everybody else who stepped in to support our students and our families. Um, this dual pandemic we know is unpredictable and can get lonely at times, um, but it's reminded me also of the kindness of the human spirit. Uh, most people at their core are kind and willing to step up to help others. And so just really wanna thank our partners, staff and families who stepped up. Know that I appreciate you and this district appreciates you. These are some of our newest learners. These twin girls and their brother are with their dad getting hotspots to support their learning at West Seattle Elementary. And as you can see, staff are pretty busy um, and the lines were really long. And so that was um, some good stuff that happened. So next slide, please. I also visited Northgate Elementary for their Start Crowd backpack distribution and want to thank our partners again at Office Depot. They handed out hundreds of stuffed back backpacks. They provided a teacher an entire office setup, which is pretty cool, and uh, uh, provided a $25,000 check for the school. And so Principal Fontler and I celebrated with the Eagle. Uh, we also recognized three Shiros for their work um, from the school supporting the families throughout the shutdown. Um, these moms took it upon themselves to serve Northgate families. They delivered food, school supplies, and really helped with anything that the families needed. And so just really wanna again, thank them. Next slide, please. As you all know, we have a big thank you to give out to Alaska Airlines and Challenge Seattle. Um, when Chief Berge informed me that our laptops or our iPads were stuck on pallets in Boston, I called Governor Gregoire to see if she could help since she leads Challenge Seattle. And this is the type of challenge that they all step up to help with. Um, she put me, she got in touch with Brad Tilden, the CEO of Alaska, who immediately found a way to help deliver the iPads. And as a result of this work, Chief Berge and the DOTS team were able to get enough of these ready for delivery to tier one and tier two schools last week. The rest will be in students' hands by the end of the week. And when I was out in schools this week, I saw a lot of volunteers who were coming into the school to really help get these devices ready. I um, just also want to thank Director DeWolf for celebrating this event as well. And thank you uh, to Cole and Cece and your moms for sharing this event with us. There are just many, many heroes amongst us. And what I've been really, I think what's great about this city is, you know, people want to support Seattle Public Schools and they've showed it in big and small ways. Next slide, please. Um, the first day of school last Friday was one of mixed emotions. Uh, as you know, we started with strong start, knowing that there would be tech issues that we would have to work out. It's sort of like uh, Chief Berge said, driving on a freeway with 5,000 cars, and then suddenly there are 50,000 more. Um, so with this in mind, our network and the team supporting it did their best to support it. Um, and it was by no means perfect, but the team held it together for most of the day. And over the weekend, they worked to troubleshoot and pushed out updates that helped this week. Uh, I'd want to thank Principal Campbell at Robert Eagle staff for inviting me to the sixth grade open house. Families stepped up, uh, stopped by to get computers, library books, planners, Robert Eagle staff, Raven swag, and to meet some of the staff. And the lines again there were long, but everybody was upbeat and looking forward to learning. Next slide, please. These are uh, the Shiro's, Ms. Velma and her team. This team at Rainier View Elementary worked all summer to ensure that families uh, 
were provided meals. They often served 200 meals per day. And on Fridays, I think it got increased to 400. I just want to thank Principal Jones and Director Smith for showing up to support your team and their families. This team really is Seattle strong. Next slide. And then there's this team at Rainier Beach High School, Principal Brooks, uh, Assistant Principals Patu and Willette organized a freshman drive through for students to pick up all things beach and they also serve barbecue and just want to thank them for inviting me out for this event. Our students, our school leaders, our staff, our families and our partners really are truly amazing in this really weird year. Um, but whenever we call, they step up and they serve and I cannot say thank you to everyone often enough. Next slide, please. Directors, as you know, we have never lost sight of Seattle excellence priorities during this crisis shutdown. Uh, my small cabinet and I are more committed than ever to these priorities. We will hold ourselves accountable to centering African-American and black boys and teens in our decision-making regardless of other challenges and obstacles. Um, we'll continue to focus on these priorities and center those voices and other students furthest from educational justice. So, Thank you again for all the work you continue to do and um, just look forward to continuing to build out this school year. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Juneau. Well, we have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. So may I have a motion for the consent agenda, please? I move approval of the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second, this is Director Hampson, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Director Harrison. Thank you, Director Hampson. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Harris and seconded by Director Hampson. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, this, the consent agenda has passed unanimously. And we are on time here. Uh, so we'll just go over some housekeeping before we move into public comment. Um, we um, have now reached the public testimony portion of the agenda. Uh, we will be taking public testimony today by teleconference as stated on the agenda. So for any speakers watching through SPS TV, please call in now to ensure you're on the phone line when your name is called. Board Procedure 1430BP provides the rules for testimony, and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will summarize some important parts of this procedure. First, testimony will be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list and, if applicable, the waiting list. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones, and only one person should speak at a time, please. Speakers from the list may cede their time to another person when the listed speaker's name is called. And the total amount of time allowed will not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers and time will not be restarted after the new speaker begins. In order to maximize opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking spot, spot per meeting. If a speaker cedes time to a later speaker on the testimony list or waiting list, the person to whom time was ceded will not be called to provide testimony again later in the meeting, as there is only one speaking slot per person. Those, to not, those who do not wish to have time ceded to them may decline and retain their place on the testimony or wait list. Finally, the majority of the speaker's time should be spent on the topic they have indicated they wish to speak about. And with that, Ms. Wilson-Jones will read off uh, the testimony speakers. Thank you, Director DeWolf. A uh, quick logistical note, um, speakers, please remain muted until I call your name to provide testimony. When your name is called, please be sure you have unmuted both on your phone and also by pressing star six to unmute on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time and a chime will sound when your time is exhausted. 
And with that, moving to the first speaker on our public testimony list, Bob Watt. Bob Watt, if you're on the line, you can um, please press star six to unmute and you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, board members. By way of introduction, I spent the last decade of my work life first as the CEO of the Greater Seattle Chamber of Commerce and then as Vice President of Government and Community Relations for the Boeing Commercial Airplane Company. I want to thank Principal Laura Davis Brown, Vice Principal Joe Powell, and the whole team at Southlake for supporting this proposed name change from the very first time they heard about it. Last week, you heard from State Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos about Al Sugiyama's remarkable record of leadership in pursuit of equity and justice, including his work as a Seattle School Board member. I've been asked to address why the Seattle business community loved Al in his lifetime of work. The answer is simple. By creating the Center for Career Alternatives and later on while leading the Executive Development Institute, Uncle Al and his teams helped tens of thousands of people gain the confidence and skills they needed to find their first job and to move up the career ladders so that they could achieve their financial and career goals. In so doing, he created a talent pool for this region that was deep, diverse, and motivating. That talent pool has helped this region's business community thrive. Al left many legacies but it's safe to say that by helping so many people, many of those people from diverse communities get and keep jobs, he did more to enhance the economic vitality of this region than almost anyone. In this challenging time in our world, recognizing and celebrating Alan P. Sugiyama, who spent his lifetime creating good trouble, as the late John Lewis would say, is a wonderful way to add hope and light and a time when we all could use it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next for public testimony is Emily Churkin. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Churkin and I'm an SPS parent. I'm outraged that SPS's rushed, screens only approach to remote learning. This failure is a direct result of a refusal to consider that remote learning would be on the table again for the fall and a refusal to think about how remote learning could mean something other than iPads and laptops. As a result of this failure, you are further exacerbating the very inequity you claim to prioritize. This is inexcusable. This collective failure has resulted in four disastrous outcomes for SPS kids only three days into the school year. First, every SPS student is asked to sign a network user agreement when they log into their school issued device. This agreement is designed to protect the district in the event a student sees or shares inappropriate content. But the user agreement puts the onus on students to avoid inappropriate content, which is a developmentally misguided and puts children at risk. Second, the school issued devices are flawed in many ways and many students are turning to personal devices, which are often owned by families who have resources. But most offensively, a kid logging into the SPS system through a personal device is not forced to sign the network user agreement which means that a kid on a personal device has less legal risk than one on an SPS device. Third, these devices don't come free. You are voting today to approve $12 million in funds to pay for iPads for preschoolers. Aside from the fact that a four-year-old on an iPad is repugnant to an educator, that $12 million could fund the outdoor learning proposal you were so eager to promote last month, but about which we've heard nothing since. For, finally, it is wrong to expect children to spend hours a day on a screen. Preschoolers need hands-on tactile tools for learning, not iPads. The AAP recommends less than an hour a day for young children. This is not a win for kids, it's a catastrophe. Please explain why there is no low screen option available to families. Please do not spend $12 million of taxpayer money on iPads until you set aside money for the outdoor option you promoted. A district that cannot think creatively, cannot think outside the box, and cannot center children into decision-making will not produce students who are flexible, inspired, or empathetic humans. You are failing the children of Seattle. It is inexcusable. Thank you. you can do better. Next for public testimony is Chris Jackins. Uh, 
My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the name change of South Lake, three points. Number one, district staff discussed how the naming was chosen to be Alan T. Sugiyama High School at South Lake in order to retain a recognition of the work done at South Lake. Number two, I attended the board meeting when Sharpless was renamed to Aki Krosi. Few district people at the time expected that it might be seen as disrespectful toward a previous school board member. Number three, perhaps a similar approach to South Lake could have been used or could still be used, such as a name like Aki Krosi at Sharpless. On the racial imbalance analysis for Kimber, Kimball Elementary, four points. Number one, Kimball hovers on the edge of being racially imbalanced. It was racially imbalanced just six years ago. Number two, the capacity of Kimball will increase the district analysis presumes that this will not change the racial composition of the enrollment. Number three, in other words, the district expects that the enrollment will become racially imbalanced again within a couple years after the project. Number four, this means that the project will be used as part of a student assignment plan that is expected to create racial imbalance, which violates WAC 392-342-025. Please vote no. On the personnel report, Aaron Bennett is leaving as Executive Director of Relationships and Strategic Initiatives. I wish to thank Aaron Bennett for her good work. Also, my compliments to Speaker Emily Churkin on her testimony today. And to let you know, a hard copy of my statement was faxed to the school district four times, and the board office staff kindly let me know that the district has not yet found the copies. Thank you very much. Next for public testimony is um, Mary Sugiyama. Next for public testimony is Mary Sugiyama. If you have joined by phone, you may need to press star six to unmute now. Good afternoon. My name is Mari Sugiyama, eldest daughter of Alan Sugiyama. Thank you to Principal Davis and Vice Principal Dr. Powell of South Lake High School for your great support and commitment in renaming your school in memory of my dad and ensuring the history and legacy of a local community activist is not forgotten. Thank you to Bob Watt and Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos for your tremendous efforts as well. My family and I hope renaming and rebranding as Alan T. Sugiyama High School at South Lake will cultivate and bring a reinvigorated sense of pride for South Lake students faculty, families, and the community. This would be a remarkable honor for my dad, but not only that, it would teach and remind people of the work done by one of our own community members. My dad's activism and was inspired by the Black Power Movement and rooted in Asian American civil rights. As the community needs changed, so did his activism. This school would not only represent the Japanese American community, but also the many other people impacted by his work. Vietnamese refugees, adults impacted by the criminal justice system, East African refugees, gang involved and impacted youth, job trainers and trainees, corporate entities and his professional network that supported and hired his referrals, and last but not least, students of all ages. For my dad, learning never stopped. Whether it is a middle school reentry program, a GED program, trades programs, universities, or professional development in the corporate world, the key is identifying the formula you need to further your learning. Bootstraps don't exist for all of us to pull ourselves up, but for many people across many communities in the greater Seattle area, my dad, Alan T. Sugiyama, provided the boots and bootstraps of opportunity and education. As we face two pandemics, COVID-19 and continued racial injustice, we know representation matters. School board directors, I respectfully urge you to vote in favor of renaming to Alan T. Sugiyama High School at South Lake. Thank you. Next for public testimony is Sabrina Burr. Sabrina Burr. Good afternoon. Uh, oh. Sabrina, go ahead. Go ahead, we can hear you, sorry. Believe, inspire, empower. Those are the pillars of South Lake High School. I had the honor to work with Al Sugiyama. 
but I also had the honor when I started my career to work with San Sugiyama. Al Sugiyama's characteristics are generational and came from his father. As a diversity affairs specialist for Nordstrom, I had the honor of watching Al, and he had a way of putting a mirror up to our youth and letting them know that they were not their story, that all they needed was already inside of them. So I think that renaming South Lake High School in the name of this iconic community member is a great idea, but only if the commitment for this on the district side is bigger than a name change. If we put this man's name on the building, it must be done in the spirit and the energy of his legacy and of his life's work and the ancestral commitment to excellence and community that he comes from. On family engagement, we must tell the truth. We must stop creating silos that further erode the little bit of trust that we have with community. Superintendent Juno, you sent out a letter to community members asking them to partner with you to collect community data, to meet with you quarterly. The letter basically was asking family members to do your work for you for free across affinity groups. The same people that you had listening sessions with that rendered no results. Just more false narrative. We must demand authentic family engagement with accountability and a rubric. We now have cameras in homes. How will you do things differently than you have in the past few years? How will you build in a process for predictability for families' experience? Do you, you even Sabrina. understand the opportunity that is here? We wor we work to find a visionary, but now we have a politician. And do Please. you even know how to lead? Please prove Please me wrong. We have to do right by families now. We can't wait. Thank you, Sabrina. Next up for public testimony is Manuela Sly. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manuela Sly. I'm the proud mother of four children and president of Seattle Council PTSA. I have listened to community and I'm here today in full support of renaming of the South Lake High School to be the Alan T. Sugiyama High School at South Lake. This is to honor not only his name, but also his legacy in Seattle Public Schools. I also want to commend Director Hersey's work in community as he has been meeting with our Seattle Council PTSA's Southeast Director and a group of South End PTA leaders. Director Hersey, this is for you. We appreciate you in this very first step towards authentic community engagement. Next, I would ask you to please be intentional and unapologetic and bring ELL communities to this table. They continue to be missing. SPS policy 4129 family engagement states the district will provide support and guidance to families, teachers, and staff as they plan and implement effective family engagement efforts. Unfortunately, we do not have support and guidance, and that is the simple truth. We do have a superintendent procedure 4129 approved last year in May. The procedure highlights accountability by convening annually with the stakeholders. As president of the council, I have asked when this group will meet and I'm still waiting for a response. Additionally, communities demand SPS to honor policy 4110 and bring back the Family Community Advisory and Oversight Committee as a true commitment to family engagement. The time is now, we can no longer wait. Thank you for your attention. Next for public testimony is Francisco Irigon. Francisco? Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, after hearing all those testimonies and other things happening in the school, I know my late friend and brother, Alan Sugiyama, would run again for Seattle Public Schools. We want to thank the uh, Seattle Public Schools Board for considering renaming Salt Lake High School after my friend, fellow activist and compadre, Alan Sugiyama. This renaming is strongly supported by a whole lot of people. As you probably know, he was the first Asian American elected to the Seattle Public Schools Board of Directors. 
He also founded the Center for Career Alternatives, an agency that provided education, employment, training, and career development services to more than 30,000 people in King and Snohomish counties, and also at no cost to them. Al strongly believed that education was the key in opening doors to livable wage jobs and a pathway to achieving the American dream. Al was also a realist that that, that, that pathway oftentimes is blocked by systemic racism. Consequ consequently, he was a community activist was dedicated to and involved with the civil rights struggle. Please do the right thing by renaming the South Lake High School after Alan P. Sugiyama. I want to thank you all so very much for listening to me and to others, and also to uh, the parents of the uh, Seattle Public Schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next for public testimony is Raymond R. H. Chavar. Chavar. Apologies for the pronunciation. Raymond. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. How about now? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, when homeschooling began in March, it became painfully obvious to us that our daughter was dyslexic. Homeschooling or online learning is difficult enough without the added problem of an unaddressed learning disability. We were informed by the school psychologist that nothing could be done until school was back to brick and mortar. It is our understanding that the sooner a child is diagnosed and intervention implemented, the better. My husband and I each administered the same online dyslexia test to our daughter. The results were the same, indicating serious dyslexia. Um, her maternal grandfather was seriously dyslexic, dyslexic as well. We sent the results to Ms. Amar, the school psychologist, stating that since the SDS contracts out for assessments, we saw no reason why this could not be done during the homeschooling period. She never replied. Our schools. Our child's counselor also contacted Ms. Amar and got the same response. I also contacted the ombudsman, uh, Naomi Razine. She was supposed to get back to me, but also has been ghosting me. Though today I did get a carbon uh, copy of an email request to Jen Anderson to put me in touch with the proper supervisor. During this time of online learning procedures, need to be adjusted to accommodate the needs of the students. We are no closer to getting help for our daughter than we were in March. She is starting off the school year unnecessarily struggling. The SPS's failure to address the situation in a timely manner is affecting her desire to learn. She needs immediate assessment and help to properly adopt the behaviors that dyslexic use to cope and or mask their disability. What is SPS to remedy students getting assessed for learning disabilities and receiving the services they need to succeed? Thank Please you. Please conclude your remarks. Thank you, Raymond. That was the final speaker on the testimony list. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. So that concludes our public testimony for the meeting. We will now move to the action items on today's agenda. <clears throat> and as we move through these items today, I will first call on committee chairs and then I'll call on the remaining directors alphabetically for questions and comments. So we will now begin at action item number one. This is approval of name change of South Lake High School to Alan T. Sugiyama High School at South Lake. This came to the Operations Committee on August 13th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move for the approval. Apologies. Let me get to the right page. I move for the uh, that the school board authorize the change of the name South Lake High School to Alan T. Sugiyama High School at South Lake. Second the motion. 
Thank you, directors. This has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We will now move to directors for any comments or questions for Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta before we vote. And I will begin with our Operations Committee Chairperson, Director Mack. Hi, good evening. Um, as stated in the agenda and in the bar, this came through Operations Committee on August 13th uh, with a resounding uh, recommendation from the committee for approval. I uh, greatly appreciate all of those involved in providing additional information and support for the robust community engagement for this uh, name change. And um, additionally, in introduction, we heard testimony and uh, from State Representative uh, Sharon Tomiko Santos, as well as others about the importance of this and I appreciate the testimony uh, that came before us uh, today as well. Um, and I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Okay, next we'll be with Director Hampson. Uh, no questions uh, for me. Uh, thank you to each and every member of uh, Mr. Sugiyama's uh, family and extended uh, community. Uh, it's been um, an excellent uh, education um, for me on this uh, particular uh, individual and his accomplishments and the uh, impact that he had on his community. And I feel honored to have the opportunity to vote on this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. Uh, I could not be in more favor of this for my friend and one of my personal heroes. And I will restate my concerns that we have not given South Lake High School the attention, fund, and robust assistance that it deserves. And again, if we are going to put Uncle Al's name on it, uh, folks are watching. So I look forward to see what we do with this honor. And uh, we'll echo the comments from uh, Ms. Burr as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Hersey. <clears throat> hey, <clears throat> so no questions from me. I think that I would again echo the comments from Ms. Burr. Um, as we push forward, I am just really excited that this is going to be a change that our community is 100% behind. Um, with that said, if we are going to honor Mr. Sugiyama, we need to do it the entire way and make sure that we make good on our promises and really dig in to advocate for our children in the way that he did, to advocate for his community in the way that he did, and to continue and re begin, quite frankly, our family engagement from the beginning so that we can really truly make this name change an actual honoring of this legend and not just a PR stunt. I am so excited and I'm really happy to vote yes on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Rankin. Hi, thanks. Um, mostly just echoing what's what's been said already. It's been um, really special to hear uh, from family and friends and colleagues of Mr. Sugiyama around this item um, and, and the principal and assistant pr principal. So I really appreciate um, everyone taking the time to come in and share with us about um, Alan T. Sugiyama. And I wanna also uh, echo the sentiments expressed by Director Harris that um, uh, this is an opportunity to, to not only honor Mr. Sugiyama with a name change, but also to elevate the work that's been happening at South Lake High School um, and to hopefully help more students find their way there um, into a community uh, that's that's right for them. If, if that's what they, you know, we have so many different things to offer in the high school experience in Seattle Public Schools and South Lake is um, one of those special places that um, I think more students need to know about. Um, and, and also just repeat what uh, Director Hersey said that in honoring, um, uh, in, in, the, in the honor that comes with the name change to truly honor um, Mr. Sugiyama, we need to, to make sure that it's not just a name change, but it's that it's the whole, um, that, that we honor, it, honor him with the whole focus and that we act as he did in and of and with community and not 
at or for community. So, um, and appreciate just everybody's comments again. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Um, I probably can't say it better than all my colleagues have already expressed the um, gratitude for this opportunity to honor uh, Mr. Sugiyama, and I hope that we can find ways to support South Lake in, 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 its, in the ways that we'll honor him. And even, let's just throw it from there, because there's I know one of our community members mentioned Aki Kurosi, who was another um, Seattle teacher and social justice advocate who we honored with that name change at the school there. And I we should keep our eye on schools and how we can keep honoring those um, leaders that we do this for. Thank you. Thank you, Director Verismith. Uh, and my only uh, final comment, just I think not only want to express my gratitude for speakers today for voicing their support for this uh, name change and also uh, the speakers from our last meeting as well as Representative Tomiko Santos, um, but I wanted to read one, uh, one sentence here from the bar in the equity analysis. I think it really speaks to um, Mr. Sugiyama and I think really particularly timely given the, the conversations uh, we're all having right now in, in Seattle Public Schools. It says, Mr. Sugiyama believed that all persons need and deserve a second and sometimes third opportunity, and he promoted determination and compassion while standing up to institutional systems of racism. I can think of no other person uh, to honor at this time. Um, and so with that, Ms. Wilson-Jones, um, please uh, roll call vote. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move to action item number two. This is approve the purchase of laptops for staff and preschool and elementary school com student computers to support teaching and learning in a remote learning model. May I have a motion for this item, please? I move that the school board ratify the superintendent's execution of the purchase orders through Dell, Thornburg, Hewlett Packard, Micron, and Apple for a total not to exceed amount of $12,400,000, including estimated Washington state sales tax, with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent, and to take any necessary actions to implement the purchase orders in supportive devices for pre-K and staff. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Um, this item did not go through committee and is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Financial Officer Joanne Berge, I believe you will be briefing us. And again, I'll begin with Director Hampson uh, as the chair of uh, ANF. ANF. Um, excuse me. Yes. We'll start uh, with you, Chief, Chief Financial Officer Joanne Berge. Go ahead, Chief Berge. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. This is Jolyn Berge, Chief Financial Officer. So this bar is to ask for the board to ratify the critical purchases that were made this summer for one-to-one -one devices for our students and devices for our staff. As noted in the bar, we had two bars that were previously approved for purchasing devices, but given the pandemic, we had to rework those plans. The remaining authority for devices purchased from the June 2019 bar was four and a half million dollars. And the remaining uh, authority from the March 2020 bar was $5,753,000. And that is outlined in the finance section of this bar. <clears throat> so approval of this bar replaces those remaining amounts and those remaining amounts total $10,253,000. This bar is requesting the ratification of a new total of $12.4 million. I would note that while we tried to use previous RFPs that had been approved to purchase from because of the supply chain issues, we, brought, uh, we bought what we could from our RFP, which was Thornburg and, and the Dell devices. And then we went to Hewlett Packard for the other 5,000 laptops 
It was the only way that we were going to get them in time for school to start. And then we had not purchased iPads before, and we did go to, to Apple and purchase those iPads. Uh, that would conclude my remarks. And Director Hampson, I believe you wanted to um, have comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. Uh, thank you um, for, for providing all that background information. So this is um, very much in the spirit of full transparency. The While the school board um, had an emergency spending authorization uh, for staff in place uh, that expired um, on the last day of school, which I believe was June 19th, um, and whereas we do have, um, and I will ask Director, uh, Chief Legal Counsel Greg Narver to speak to this as well, um, whereas we do have some language within procurement for um, bidding that allows for emergency expenditures, there were parts of the expenditures that I didn't think fit under um, the emergency, um, the full amount didn't fit under the, uh, the emergency purchase guidelines either in the resolution or in policy and felt that um, for transparency that we should bring it before the board. And so um, Chief Berge, um was willing to do all that background work and I'll let um, uh, Chief Narver, Narver provide some, some legal clarification um, as to why um, we felt that was necessary. And is Chief Legal Counsel Greg Narver on? I am on. Okay. Yes, yes. Do you want to read? Do you want to restate your question for him? Um, sure, uh, Chief uh, Counsel Narver. Would you be willing to just speak briefly about um, why we needed to bring this forward to the full board uh, um, for a, a ratification? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm apologies, I didn't realize that was stated as a question before uh, for the silence. Uh, well, the, a purchase of this size has to be approved by the board, of course, and the timeline was is laid out in the background here why, uh, you know, why it's coming at this point. Um, you and I consulted about, I won't go into the details of that consultation, but did this really fit within an emergency purchase that the board would be ratifying under one particular provision, or is this simply uh, uh, a ratification of uh, under under the regular contract provision? And we we agreed that was that was the proper way to bring it before the board. Thank you. So um, yeah, so I just wanted to provide that that background um, that this was something that was that I knew that we had discussed in our um, approvals for expectations around technology expenditures um, during this period and, and the timing of expenditures being different than what we might have imagined last year. Um, and then there being some, some carryover, but for the sake of transparency, um, I, I noted that there were some that I did that didn't fit into any particular box um, in terms of approvals. And so um, ask that we bring it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Director Hampson. Thank you for that background. Um, we'll next move to Director Harris. I'll pass for now, but if you could uh, loop me in at the end, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Absolutely, yep. Director Hersey. No questions for me at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, yeah, I have one question, and then I uh, I understand that uh, Director Rivera Smith posed a number of questions uh, that I'd like to have daylit and responded to, um, and I'll I'll uh, allow her to 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 go through those. Um, but my one question is just to get clarity on um, for the Bex five levy. Um, does this amount of expenditure over extend beyond what the commitment was in the BEX-5 levy? No, it, do, it doesn't, Director Mack, but we're close to spending all of the BEX-5 money. We have a little bit left, I think a few million dollars left for some other um, replacement devices, but it did use up most of the authority. Um, and I also, uh, I apologize, I did realize one other thing I did want to bring up, that um, in the bar it states um, some information about the technology plan 
and that I just want for clarity that the plan was never a board approved document um, and was only presented kind of cursorily to the board. Um, uh, and just for clarity, I think that needs to be stated um, and that I would strongly advocate that our efforts to uh, put a technology planning policy in place sooner than later um, start. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll hold my comments until after others. Thank you. Director Rankin. Uh, thanks. Um, I just want to, uh, I guess, reiterate, confirm that this is a purchase that has already been made and we are ratifying that uh, action that has already happened. Um, and just to respond to the uh, Ms. Cherkin who gave public testimony, um, I have a lot of the same kind of pedagogical and developmental concerns about appropriateness of devices. However, in a remote setting, the thing that we have to have first and foremost is is a way to contact and let every single family have access. Um, and so for me, the the device is a necessity for a connection between child and a, a child and teacher. And I personally make a distinction between um, looking at a screen in communication with a live person and a child being left to their you know, own owned devices, no, no pun intended, um, with an app or other kind of passive, um, passive or active kind of um, electronic entertainment. So I just wanted to sort of say, hear those concerns absolutely. And, and my hope and knowing that the educators that we, that we have um, working with our learners, learner, working with our youngest learners, um, that the devices really are about, uh, access um, and shouldn't be the, you know, the main source of, of interaction for a student with electronics, but with a, with a person, with contact with a person. So that's all. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Um, let me just start with a probably easy question here. In the bar um, under the description of the purchases, can you explain the micro K-12 and Thornburg iPad processing the British school? That's, was that separate of, I, I'm trying to understand what that, what that was for exactly? Yeah, the, um, thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. So those are the two contractors that we have that picked up the devices from Alaska Airlines and they took them to their facilities and they have to break them down between 90 pallets worth of stuff and put them into shipments for each individual school and then they deliver them to the schools. Thank you. Okay. And so I'm going to back way, way up um, to some just just to build on what uh, Director Rankin brought up. Um, I did send an email earlier today to the board and, and just a couple of the chiefs and superintendent just to back up again. Um, looking at our June 3rd budget work session where we I thought we had a really great conversation about um, the device purchasing and, and what we wanted to do for our students. Um, a lot of focus was on the elementary one-to-one -one devices. And um, and I feel like I th that was the last I kind of heard about anything until we purchased iPads and, and, and laptops and now it's happening. And I get, I get the urgency, um, no fault on anybody for that because it was something we needed to do and it needed to be fast. This has been a fascinating situation. Um, but, you know, I, I think there was just some lack of follow-up that um, at least personally I wasn't in the loop for, so I was at a loss for some things. I did email about those. Um, some things that I'm still not sure on, um, and, and just to touch on some of that, was um, at that meeting we heard how Chief Black was running six different digital learning work groups, um, which sounded great. Um, I never heard what came out of those. That was never shared, at least with the full board. So how I'm going to guess that in there, and then you say that you did um, consult with ITAC, where in there did it turn from laptops to iPads? Because when you had that meeting on June 3rd, you, you, you specified how um, schools were, were leaning towards laptops, how even when they had been offered iPads, they were not taking you up on those. Um, and it sounded, and I, I not, not that I'm cheering for iPads, I'm just, or against them, I'm just wondering because where did the direction change at that point? Um, I just was not aware what, what turned it there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually have your email in front of me and I'm happy to respond to the questions that you had. So we were 
one of the things, um, do you want me to go over all the questions or you just want me to answer the one you just asked? <laughs> do I start with the one I just asked? Yeah. Okay. So at the end of the day, I was directed to go back to IPAC. Oh, sorry, Director DeWolf. No, I was, okay. I was directed to go back to the ITAC committee, which is our advisory committee. And, you know, both Director Hersey and Director Rankin had raised um, differences of opinion about iPads and reconsideration of those. And that's all that happened is that we reconsidered. We did some research with ITAC. Um, and ITAC came back with a recommendation for iPads for grades K-2. We do have teacher librarians and teachers sitting on the ITAC committee. So that was the process that I was directed to use, and, and that's what we did. I, I did write really probably maybe one of my better emails to you in late June, but apparently I didn't send it to the right email address. <laughs> and Director Hampson brought that to my attention later as we were discussing it. Um, so I'm happy to resend that. It really lays out how what research ITAC used and the process that we used to make the decision for the iPad. Um, so all that was laid out in the email, and I thought everyone had gotten it. So I apologize for that. Um, I will say that too that touch screens for K3 were purchased. So the laptops that were purchased um, do include touch screens. We did go to ITAC. We you some of the board members really asked us to reconsider that decision, and we did that. We did that honest work, and we reconsidered where we were at, and the decision came out differently, and that's why we ended up with iPads. Okay, no, and, and I appreciate that that work was done. Definitely. Um, again, there was a breakage in the loop there because I guess the, the email. Wow, well, um, sorry. Didn't make it its way. And I know, yeah, I mean, these things happen. I just, again, I, I was just trying to follow up. I know it's really late to be doing that, but on that. Um, and let me just look back at me and see what is really applicable right now. I just, again, like, that was just part of that. And it's just that transparency because I mean, Suddenly, we're buying iPads, and I'm like, when did we approve that purchase? And how can I explain this to people why we chose that? Because, you know, there is um, a lot of chatter just, you know, amongst families about how it's not working for everybody, but that's laptops too. It's not, it's not like either one was going to be the magic bullet. Um, we're having a lot of difficulties right now. I just I wanted to just see how that happened, how we came to that decision. And I'm trying to think about anything. Oh, so I also did get a, um, a question from families who are getting iPads. Would, if they prefer, if they would prefer a laptop, can they request and get an, an SPS laptop instead? Because for some students, it just doesn't jive with their, you know, use of a device to be on the touchscreen iPad. Yeah, as I understand it, we are asking everyone to be consolidated on the same platform. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the teaching environment for the teacher becomes super difficult. So part of the purchase was that we bought iPads for the teacher as well as for the students so that they could be on the same device together at the same time. And we did buy key um, keyboards for second graders as well to ease them into that transition to laptops. If a family wants to do a bring your own device for a K through second, can they use a laptop still? Will that work? Or they, will it they could. Work? They could. We are recommending that they use an iPad for even bring your own device just because of the way some of the applications functions on an iPad may look and feel different. Okay. And then I think last question here. Was some of the purchasing, do we, do we, I, I understand we, we got, earbuds or headphones of some sort have those been i i've only seen this amongst parents talking i had not seen our district announce this um do we have yeah. those families amazon donated five thousand earbuds to us and so we were have been distributing those the last couple of days and in fact um superintendent and i went to six schools in west seattle yesterday and dropped off dropped off a bunch of earbuds so they are for families who don't have them and it's part of the checklist that we're asking teachers to do as far as you know make sure they have a device make sure that they're connected and you've seen them connect and if they need like earbuds or other things hot spots um let us know so it's all part of making sure kids have what they need great thank you so much no further questions thank you director bear smith um director harris uh, thank you for looping me around i appreciate the transparency initiative here um, and, and I am very pleased that, that we did this. Uh, one of the concerns that I have with respect to the rollout here, we just heard about 25,000 login. That, that's a darn sight less than 53. Do we have an idea how many of our students still do not have connectivity, either because of lack of hardware 
or because of hotspots or internet access? Hi, Dr. Harris. We don't have any more firm numbers. So we know that at least 10,000 of those students are kids without iPads yet, right? Because those have been rolling out. They're due to roll out um, tomorrow was the day that we were rolling out the iPads to everyone. So we think it could be a combination of just maybe people don't think school starts until the 14th and we need to give them a reminder. Um, so we haven't heard anything. There hasn't been anything coming back from principals who are keeping in touch with us and they do have a way to route requests to us. So I know that we still, you know, are working through all of our um, tech tickets that we have, if there's some connection issues, but that's all we know for now. I just think it's a new environment and we're going to continue to ask our schools to report out to us. Um, have they connected with each student? What does that look like? I think that we'll firm up some of that information hopefully by Monday. And how will you report back to the board and the community at large on that? Uh, we can do it in a Friday memo. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I um, don't have a question, but I do have a request for the Friday memo. Can you, Chief Berge or Superintendent Juneau, just share what um, the McKinney-Vento team the plan is to um, provide education and educational services to our students experiencing homelessness. Just a request for the Friday memo um, would be great. Yes, yeah, so and I, I remember you requested that. So thanks for the reminder. Thank you. Okay, Director Mack, you have one final question, please. Um, well, yes, and they're connected or they're, they're yes, they're connected. So. Uh, the question was asked about headphones and providing those for students, and I understand there's some, been some donations. Um, and uh, I'm curious about first the uh, whether or not we're allocating any additional dollars in our budget to support that effort, um, as having headphones, I think, is actually really important and helpful for students, especially if they're in an environment where they have to sit next to their sibling. Um, and having access to those is, you know, it's an expensive additional cost that um, many families could not afford. So I'm wondering if we actually have any budget left over. And the other question is about my concern well, around the infrastructure the issues. The topic um, of the bar is about the purchase of the laptops and devices. Right, so the question is about the allocation of the BEX $5 towards technology, which this bar is, and has done that, um, and whether or not there are dollars left over for infrastructure improvements that may be necessary given that our uh, traffic has gone from 6,000 to 50,000 overnight in terms of our VPN and the infrastructure of servers. And again, I think those are technically not laptop purchase um, bar questions. So if, if folks are not prepared, um, Friday memo might be an opportunity as well. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that really quickly. It's just, um, do we have extra money for those things? No, but do we have to find money for those things? Yes. Uh, so we continue to work with our community partners like Amazon towards donations and we'll buy what we have to to make sure our kids have what we need. There are some smaller purchases that we're making, you know, $80,000, things like that to shore up some of our um, tech issues. And we did just get approval from the state uh, to expand our pipeline four times past what it is now, which is long overdue. And we've had that request into them for a few months. And from a financial perspective, is that does that have a dollar attached to it? Or do we do we know what that is at this point or have an estimation? I think when I recall, yeah, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars, so we'll be able to cover it, and the state gives us some funding. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call, please. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Director Mack? 
Director Mack. Apologies, still debating. Abstain. Thank you. Director DeWalt. Aye. This motion has passed by a vote of six yes to, to zero no to one abstention. Thank you. We will now move to action item number three, approval for contract amendment with school data solutions for school-based implementation of MTSS student data portal. This also known as RFP 09615. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on August 17th for consideration. So may I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move the school board authorize the superintendent to execute a contract amendment with school data solutions, the amount of $300,765 for the student data portal homeroom in the form of the contract amendment dated July 15th, 2020 and attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract amendment. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. So we'll now move to directors for any comments or questions for Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement, Wyeth Jesse, before we vote. And we'll begin with our Audit and Finance Committee Chairperson, Director Hampson. Yes, thank you. Um, so we had quite a bit of discussion about this uh, in terms of the extent to which it's utilized to um, track student performance um, and status comprehensively and uh, I think uh, and, and how deep that goes um, in terms of utilization as well as um, how it's going to look and be utilized during uh, remote learning um, environments and so um, that was kind of where a lot of the questions were, were focused and um, I'll turn it over to Chief um, Jesse to kind of give the, the quick summary on, on those and anything else he deems relevant. Thank you, Director Hampson. Yeah, so the, the conversations really have been around um, how we utilize this tool. Um, we are now in our third uh, year of full implementation of Homeroom. This product is usually referred to as Homeroom. Um, and uh, so we've just been really building, not only utilizing the tool, but also the practices. Uh, a lot of that conversation also was around the pivot uh, in remote learning. Uh, what are we utilizing it for? And so those are the things where we are centering ourselves around attendance and engagement, um, as well as uh, the priority standards. And so uh, already the teams are mobilizing, um, really looking, getting ready to help schools set up groups so they can support uh, those students who need further assistance. Um, and then also just around um, our opportunity to use multiple data points and helping drive decisions on the student's story, strength, and needs. Okay, Director Hampson, any more questions? Uh, no, we had good discussion in committee as well as um, last week because uh, we had put it forth for consideration. So um, if there are uh, I, I, we did get some follow-up information that um, uh, was was much more detailed, and so I think um, I'll leave it to other directors to ask uh, any questions they feel have yet to be uh, answered. Thank you. Director Harris. Uh, this is, I think, an exceptional tool that has been underutilized to date. This is no surprise to Chief Jesse and others, and certainly members of the Audit and Finance Committee. Uh, given the fact that we are doing check-ins now with each of our families, it's my hope that we exponentiate by a factor of a thousand or two uh, the utilization of this tool. Um, the, the stats, or excuse me, the data that has come forth before is, is not that impressive, and, and I hope this is the year that we really make it work um, for our family. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Hersey. No additional questions from me. Excited to have this tool ready to go. Thank you. Director Mack. No questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. 
I, I don't have questions, but I have a request that um, Chief Jesse will probably nod his head. Of course, she wants to do that. Um, I would like to request a one on one just to get a better sense of, of how this tool works and what type of data is in it and how how we're using it um, for MTSS and, and how it aligns with um, our values and, and everything else that's going on. I would just really appreciate the opportunity to see that in a little more detail. Thanks, Director. Our team will do that, Director Rankin. Thank you. Director Nevada Smith. Thank you. Um, we have had lots of conversations on this so far, and I can't think of any of any questions I have. But I, I do feel, and it's not just for this one, but for all of our investments um, that we do, like this, as so just you know, three hundred thousand um, dollars. We we purchase tools like this. I would just love for somehow we can share this with families, how we are using this, and how this is improving um, their child's experience in schools. Because you know, this, this this brings down to you know the. The level that it's understandable for families because we should you know be able to let them know that we are investing in their students thank you thanks director Yvetta smith um chief jesse i don't have any questions for you at this time i will i'll probably email you separately offline i had an lgbtq community meeting last night and had just some just some offline questions but i have no more questions on this thank you um so miss wilson jones roll call please Director Rivera Smith. Hi. Was that an I? Sorry. That was an I. Director Hampson. I. Director Harris. I. Director Hersey. I. Director Mack. I. Director Rankin. I. Director Wall. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, directors. Next, we'll move to item action item number four. This is Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSPI, Beginning Educator Support Team, otherwise known as BEST, grant approval. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on August 17th for consideration. So may I have a motion for this item, please? I move that the board authorize the superintendent to accept the 2020 to 21 best grant in the amount of $300,000 and to implement the provisions of the grant. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. So we'll now move to directors for any final comments or questions before, we, before the vote for Chief Human Resources Officer, Dr. Clover Codd. And we'll begin with our Audit and Finance Committee Chairperson, Director Hampson. Um, I don't have um, a whole lot to to add to this. Um, obviously, this is a, something that comes to us through OSPI and um, to support beginning teachers. And um, I think I'll just leave it to Direct, uh, Chief Codd to introduce it and hear from if you have any remaining questions from directors. Thank you, Director Hampson. This is Clover Codd, Chief Human Resource Officer. So we introduced this at the last board meeting. I haven't received any new questions from directors between then and now. So um, if you do have additional questions, directors, go ahead. I'm, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Dr. Codd. We'll start first. Well, not first. We'll start with Director Harris. No questions from me. I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. Um, for me. Thank you, Director Mack. No questions, thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, not for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Rivetta Smith. No questions, thank you. Thank you, and no questions from me, Dr. Codd. Um, thank you for the work on this and excited um, for this. So we'll move to Ms. Wilson Jones for the roll call vote. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. 
Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Chair DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. We will now move to action item number five. It is amend board policy number 5253, maintaining professional staff slash student boundaries. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on August 17th for consideration. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with Seattle Central College for a total not to exceed amount of five. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wrong motion. I move that the school board amend board policy 5253, maintaining professional staff student boundaries as attached to the board action report. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. President we'll DeWolf to Director amendment. Yes, that is correct. Is do any directors have an amendment on the floor? Proverbial uh, floor. This is the uh, this is Director Mack. I would like to propose an amendment. Okay, Director Mack. Um, uh, Mr. Narver, can you help me with the, uh, should I do a motion language or should I just say I move to amend the attached policy revisions on page two of three of the policy to read as is attached and presented on the screen as Ms. Wilson-Jones had just flashed up, um, and I think she'll flash up in a second. Yes, what, oh yes, what you, what you want to do is say, uh, I move that the, uh, and then you would, uh, sorry, is that, is it going to go up on the screen here? I think Tina is working on it right yeah, now. Yeah, it's coming, uh, okay. one second. Thank you guys. Okay, so uh, the motion you're offering isn't to change anything in the bar. It's to make a further revision to the policy that is being uh, amended through this bar. So you would say that you move to uh, uh, further amend the policy with this language. Um, you should read uh, verbatim the language that you want added to the policy and make clear in your motion where in the policy that uh, that new language would go. Okay, great. So I move. Sorry. I'm happy to help okay. identify where that too, if it's helpful. Okay. So I move to further amend policy number two, uh, 5253, maintaining professional staff and student boundaries, to include uh, the following language on page two of three following the sentence employees whose conduct violates this policy may face disciplinary action up to and including termination consistent with the district's policies acceptable use agreement and collective bargaining agreements as applicable this new language is all district staff shall report any boundary violation that constitutes abuse neglect or exploitation under seattle school board policy number 3421 to their supervisor or appropriate school administrator. In addition, all professional school personnel shall report any boundary violation that constitutes abuse, neglect, or exploitation under school board policy number 3421 to law enforcement or child protective services within 48 hours. I second the amendment. Okay, so Greg, just to clarify, we we will go through the amendment uh, discussion first, and then back to the underlying motion as amendment. Correct. You'll have debate on okay. the amendment at this point, and then a roll call vote as to whether or not to adopt this amendment. Okay, so we'll start with Director Mack quickly here on um, just any final background or anything you want to raise here before we move to other directors. Um. Yes, uh, I appreciate that this uh, language is new to some on the board, that it was just uh, developed and 
put forward this afternoon. Um, so apologies for the late notice. I did attempt to have the meeting with staff to uh, get clarity on some of the questions that were raised in intro. Um, and uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks. So that meeting didn't um, take place in, until this afternoon, just before um, this board meeting. And uh, uh, a special thanks to Mr. Sirkwe for um, uh, discussing the questions that I had around this policy and concerns around clarifying um, in this policy as well, uh, mandatory reporting um, of issues. Um, and that, that it's, it, 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 from my opinion, important to have this also referenced in this policy to be uh, explicit um, when we're talking about student safety. And I think this goes very much in line with our recent work session around student safety. And this amendment um, resolves uh, the concerns I had and was raising um, previously. Thank so with you. that, I'm happy to uh, uh, entertain any questions about the amendment from uh, directors. Sure, thank you, Director Mack. Okay, so first we'll begin uh, with um, Director Hampson. Hi. Um, yes, I I, pre I understand the concern and the the reference, um, and and I actually had received a communication from a constituent about it, and I I think what I had stated is my concern about why I wasn't didn't feel the need to bring in the mandatory reporting is that this is about um, in a, it, it, wanting to encompass the remote environment we're in importantly. Um, about boundaries between students and uh, and staff, and which includes volunteers, and wanting to provide clarity about about you know how that is managed, and it's it's delicate in um, in the best cases. And um, one of the fears that I have, the unintended consequences, that as much as I understand the logic of this amendment, um, is that it would encourage would go beyond what that relationship is between. Um, teachers and students and would potentially incur over encourage uh, staff to report to CPS and to police on matters that they're witnessing remotely in children's homes. And um, and I have really grave uh, concerns about that um, where where good intention goes awry. And so that that's um, you know it's we need to remind folks that they're our mandatory reporters. I'm just um, nervous about the concept of of overemphasizing it in this particular context, which is meant to um, specifically discuss that um, staff student relationship. Um, so those are those are my my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Director Hampson. Director Harris. I appreciate comments uh, thus far from both of my colleagues, uh, I would suggest that it is not a given that at least in the past, some of our educators have not fulfilled their mandatory reporting statutory role. I, I see this as an appropriate amendment. Thank you. Director Hersey. To me, this seems pretty straightforward. Um, I don't have any questions. I'm still thinking through. I, I, I worry about unintended consequences here a little bit, but I'm still I'm still thinking through. So I will let you know if I need you to loop back to me or not. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Rankin. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I I have some concerns about um, this actually conflating a couple different policies. I know when this was introed, um, Director Mack and I both had some questions about uh, making sure that language um, language and kind of uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, any anything kind of relational with students that. You know, we look at this with make sure that it's consistent with the other set of policies that we're looking at um, under safety and security. And I actually feel pretty strongly that um, 
uh, this amendment muddies this a little bit because this policy is really about keeping appropriate relationships between students and staff and and um, not crossing boundaries that are you know outside of the bounds of an appropriate and I know appropriate is up for you know uh, interpretation but um, uh, or could be um, but that this is really about uh, relational boundaries and a boundary violation that constitutes abuse, neglect, or exploitation is not a boundary of violation. It is simply abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And that moves it into something different than this policy is addressing. Um, and so for that reason, I will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Um, I, I, I I appreciate your, everybody's perspective on this. Um, I I don't know that it will have the harm some might be worried about. Um, and this is I haven't thought much more about it than being introduced here, so I'm trying to think uh, fully about that. Everything's going to have unintended consequences, so we can't use that as a reason not do something. But at the same time, um, just judging what the magnitude of those may be. Um, I think it's never a bad idea to remind our educators of their mandatory reporting responsibilities. Um, but but yeah, I'm I'm also still thinking still thinking about it. So um, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have no questions on the amendment. Thanks for the uh, clarification and background, Director Mack. Um, so um, with but uh, Mr. DeWolf, can I um, respond to the? Uh, concerns. Sure. Quickly, quick, quick, quickly, please. Yes. Um, so I appreciate that the uh, folks are thinking about unintended consequences, but one of the unintended consequences of not actually explicitly clarifying um, the responsibilities of our staff to um, ensure that other staff or volunteers are not harming our students and to, to bring those to the attention of appropriate folks and not just shove it under the rug. Um, the concern that I have with not being explicit about it is that the language that was previously in this policy around um, uh, with respect to sexual harassment and other potential issues of grooming and things like that, it has been removed. And this policy is actually, does go beyond just, um, you know, how they communicate with each other. It is literally talking about catching and clarifying and making sure that um, harm is not coming to our students in these ways. Um, so I would, I would, I would put that to you that, that our, greatest responsibility is keeping our students safe and if they don't have a safe place in which to um, report an issue or they know that it will be actually managed if something is inappropriate um, they won't and they won't be protected so I, I i i think that's a bold statement that i, I i'm not sure i fully support that kind of broad statement um, but we do need to move to the vote for this. So, Ms. Wilson Jones. Can, sorry, can I? Uh, so, oh, sorry, the thing I was looking at just went away. Is there a way to bring that back up, the amendment? Tina, can yes, you put the yeah. amendment back on the screen, please? Uh, wait one moment, please. Um, but I, I do take some issue with the, uh, the idea that. Um, there is a lack of concern for student safety by not supporting this amendment. And I, I don't think yes. that's the case at all. Um, but I'm wondering if there's maybe a different way to phrase it that would sit better with people just as a reminder that there is a policy that protects students or that governs our response to abuse and whatnot. Um, I, I think the, the kind of um, relational uh, interactions that this policy is addressing are important enough that they are a distinct policy from abuse, harassment, neglect, 
uh, and I don't want it muddied by having you know people be able to say, well, it's not really abuse, it's just inappropriate, so I won't do anything about it. Um, so that is, um, I, I don't know how to, I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. I don't know. Thank you, Director Rankin. We do need to move to the vote on this. So Ms. Wilson Jones, roll call please. Um, calling the vote on the amendment, uh, Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Nay. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Abstain. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin? Nay. Um, Director DeWolf? Abstain. Apologies, I'm just trying to get back to the right screen to count the The vote has um, this motion has passed by a vote of three to two to two. OK, we'll move to the underlying motion. Greg, do we need to do any um, wording on the record for um, coming back to the underlying motion as amended? Well, the, we want to clarify for the record that the vote on the underlying motion is now going to be, sorry, don't have calling the language back up here. Um, it would be uh, moving that the school board amend policy number 5253, maintaining professional staff student boundaries as attached to the board action report and as amended. So the, the motion language now should explicitly note that the policy changes that are going to be voted on by the board uh, are affected by the amendment that just passed. Chief Narber, this is Chief Cox. I am a bit confused by the three to two to two. Wouldn't that mean the amendment failed? Our abstentions do not count in the, um, they count toward quorum, but not in the vote total. Correct. Thank you. So, sorry, this is Director Rankin. So just to clarify, abstentions, wait, so we don't actually need a majority of the board to vote on something to approve it, just a majority of the yeses and nos? Yeah, with the uh, abstentions count towards a quorum. Uh, as uh, Ms. Wilson Jones said, but the, they, uh, yeah. So they, with two abstentions, essentially the vote is out of five. Correct. Got it. That's Thank why you. an abstention is different than a no vote. Thank you. So we need a new motion for this item as attached and as amended. Correct. I think that the record should reflect that. Yes. Uh, so this is Director Hampson. I will move uh, to amend board policy number 5253, maintaining professional staff student boundaries as amended. Second. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We'll now move to directors for final questions and comments on the underlying motion as attached and as amended. We'll start first with Director Hampson, Audit and Finance Committee Chairperson. Uh, thank you. So um, this, uh, we the discussion around this um, in Audit and Finance primarily had to do with uh, not having accompanying procedure. And I think, um, you know, there's, depending on, on the policy, um, but that we definitely have, you know, philosophical 
um, variability in terms of whether uh, we need to have a procedure coming uh, forthcoming with the um, uh, the board action itself. And I want to remind um, board members that um, and staff that uh, procedure uh, superintendent procedure does need to come to to the uh, the board for review, not not as an action, but but needs to be sent to us when it's developed. And that if board feels that that um, procedure is not consistent with policy, that we do have the option to to amend superintendent procedure. Um, that being said, um, I do think um, I, I support this particular amendment set of amendments because I do feel that it um, significantly clarifies some important aspects of again student and staff um, boundaries and and relationships and at a time when we do need to be particularly thoughtful um, we are not I don't believe in an environment where we can um, write policy to answer all questions and policies are living documents and need to be um, and again, this is a, a philosophical um, approach that, that policies are living documents and they need to reflect the growth of the organization and the learning that the organization encounters. And we are at a, um, a time of extreme um, exponential growth in, in learning about how we do um, certain things and what, how we maintain boundaries in a virtual space. Um, and for that reason, I think it's important that we provide guidance as a board, uh, knowing full well that we will learn quite a bit over this year that will influence how we might see this going forward and will inform uh, procedure, which I know um, Chief Codd will, will speak to in terms of how that will be forthcoming. Um, and I think that this is an important way for us as a board to indicate uh, that we need to do this work. Um, again, I, I do want to state that I, um, I have um, concerns about conflating this with um, uh, the mandatory reporting factor. It, it's um, relevant, but I, I think that we do also already state it um, in here, um, but I still support having guidance from the board as to um, what expectations are. Um, and board members are also mandatory report reporters. Um, and so for those of us that are heavily involved in our communities and with students or, or volunteer, um, it, 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 it forces us to even think about those relationships um, when we have student representation. And I think it creates a level of thoughtfulness that we need to encourage and have people um, thinking about um, and, and being really clear about um, and transparent about. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Codd to talk about some of the specifics. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I learn I learn every time we talk about this policy, I learn a little bit more. So I appreciate the amendment that you all approved. Um, and I do think that it does just re reinforce policy 3241. Um, I am deeply concerned um, whether the amendment um, was in here or not. I am deeply concerned about the potential for over-reporting um, and the impact that it may have on communities um, in, in this remote model. I'm not quite sure what to do about that, but I do think we need to address that with some training head on. Um, I am passionate about this policy. I think that while policy 3241 and 5253 are distinct um, and important in their own right, they also, there are some, the training that needs to happen that encompasses both. Um, the, I believe we have answered director's questions with respect to this policy between audit and finance committee introduction. And now if there are any other questions, please let me know the procedures. As soon as this policy, if approved, we will start not only drafting the procedures to, uh, closely follow the WASDA model procedures, but we will also get input from the same people we got input from on the policy as we were going through this. We also need to work with our labor partners to make sure that we're not changing working conditions. Um, if you look at the WASDA model procedure, the assumptions are that we're in an in-person school model. And all of the examples are really kind of about that. Um, and we need to really think through what could um, some examples be in this remote instructional model that we're in now because we're not just talking about what happens on Facebook or 
you know, sort of private chats. I mean, we're talking about we're in a world where the teaching and the instruction between the student and the teacher is happening virtually. And might there be boundary violations that occur? And what would that look like? Um, so there's a lot uh, more work to do on just to be able to operationalize and implement this policy. I would appreciate your vote today. This is important. We've got to get going. Um, we've got to be able to start to communicate out to staff that we have policy changes and we've got to get going on the procedures and then the new training that goes along with it. Thank you, Dr. Todd. Director Hampson, any more questions or comments before we move to Director Harris? Uh, no, thank you so much. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, as stated earlier this morning in an email to my colleagues and a question to uh, senior staff and Chief Todd, um, I, I'm distressed that we keep talking about doing superintendent procedures at the same time as policy. And, and I think this is important enough to bring the superintendent procedures together for all the reasons that have been mentioned already. Uh, I am in favor of more protection for our students. We've all seen student harm. It's um, devastating to see. And this is something that we've been talking about for well over a year. And I'm not quite sure why if we know some form of this will be put forth, probably passed, that it can't come together. I will be voting no. And I did pose questions about what other districts of like size nationally we look at for this um, policy for best practices. It seems as though we've had less benchmarking with other districts in the past year or so. And, and I'm curious about that as well. Thank you. Director Harris, this is um, Clover Codd again. Um, so. Uh, a couple of ways that I'd like to respond to that. So when we did our benchmarking, we really benchmarked policy 5253 against the WASDA model policy for the state of Washington. That's really the benchmarking on how we write policies. Um, kind of the, that's typically what we follow. When we do benchmarking with other districts across the country, what we do is we look to the Council of Great City Schools and we look at kind of types of reporting that's going on, number of incidents per thousand employees. Um, you know, Seattle is actually, uh, we have more reporting than most districts. The median reporting would be 15 um, incidents per 1,000 employees. We, we are at 30, um, which is on the very high end. So you could look at that a couple of different ways. People are reporting things that they see um, or more incidents are happening or more reporting's going on. And in other places, maybe less reporting's going on. We don't really know the answer to that. Um, with respect to best practices, I wanna take that under advisement and think about as we do our training and as we write these procedures, what are some of the best practices that we need to be thinking about to truly engage our, our staff around understanding these policies um, and not just reading them, but understanding them and being able to make sure that they're able to follow. So um, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, but that's all the benchmarking that we've done to date. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ursi. No additional questions for me at this time. Thank you, Director Rankin. Excuse me, Director Mack. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the conversation around the superintendent procedures and want to point out that in the bar, there are the WASDA model procedures. And the procedures actually go even further in depth, uh, mentioning what we've just amended the policy to clarify, mentioning the policy uh, 3421, um, as well as it very specifically um, clarifies what a boundary invasion is that it's an act or pattern of behavior by a staff member or volunteer that does not have bona fide health, safety, and educational purpose of the student. Um, it goes on to say that inappropriate physical or sexual conduct is inappropriate and uh, needs to be reported. It's it's the procedure that attack that is uh, was written alongside this by WASDA is pretty comprehensive. It talks about how 
Uh, it's required that violations need to be reported. It gives uh, clarification around what kind of behaviors are inappropriate. And it's really focused on uh, uh, staff and volunteers um, and their adult appropriate behavior. It's not focused on students. It's focused to protect students from potentially adverse behaviors. Um, the, the procedure also does go into uh, clarifying investigations and documentations, uh, and it has a section on reminder about reporting sexual abuse um, and uh, disciplinary, disciplinary action and training. So while I'm typically not comfortable um, adopting policies without the drafted procedures um, attached, there is already, if we follow the WASDA model procedure, it's pretty cons comprehensive. And as long as our procedures follow this um, model uh, to the extent that they're as clear as they are, um, then I have uh, more confidence in uh, voting yes on this with the amendment as it's um, been presently approved. So I appreciate the clarification that the procedures will be written and that there's a WASDA model procedure already there that clarifies a lot of our questions. Thank you. Director Rankin. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to respond to uh, Dr. Codd, I guess, and just um, appreciate and reemphasize um, what she said about um, the importance of training connected to this and particularly addressing boundaries in a remote setting that, as she said, a lot of the WASDA policies and, and other things are all um, we're all uh, come from a time other than now, which is remote, and that um, we're seeing with with students and you know ourselves. I think too, just our sense of different boundaries are are different because we're literally in our homes. Um, we're in our homes, which is is for some of us more comfortable. Some some people might be less comfortable in their homes, but there's a change in dynamic in relationships in that we're remote. Also, being online. Um, if kids or or educators are people who are really comfortable with social media, just the act of being on a laptop, um, your sense of boundaries and kind of what's what's appropriate, what's not appropriate could change just by the very fact of being on a laptop, which you're used to being could be used to being on in a more kind of casual uh, social media kind of setting. So I think that is super critical. Um, and uh, uh, look forward to that that happening, and and just just the continuing conversation about um, safety boundaries, all kinds of things, and how they're very different. They're very different now in a remote setting, and they're also in terms of cultural competency and kind of family values and cultural values and whatever we may see that. Um, we are no longer in a situation where students are in our classrooms. We're now all guests in students' homes. And so I'm particularly interested in and concerned about our uh, response as, a, as individuals across the system to that setting of being in students' homes and how they respond to it. Um, so I guess just to reiterate that that the the focus that this is on is about boundaries and relationships and interaction, not necessarily in a way that talks about physical harm. And physical harm is something, of course, students need to be protected from. But this is a the type of boundary that we're talking about is really critical to address and identify and know how to respond to it. And so. Um, I just yeah appreciate that and, and look forward to knowing more about um, the procedures around this. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rivera Smith. No questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and no questions or comments for me. So we can move to uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson Jones. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. 
No. Director Hersey? Aye. Uh, Director Mack? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Motion has passed by a vote of six yes to one no. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Okay, next we'll move to uh, action item number six. Approval of contract to support the Open Doors Youth Reengagement Program for the 2020 through 2021 school year. This came through Curriculum and Instruction Committee on August 18th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with Seattle Central College for a not to exceed amount of $516,000 over fiscal years 2020 to 21 in the form of the draft agreement attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We'll now move to directors for any final comments or questions for Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Diane DeBacker, before we vote. And we will begin today uh, on this item with Director Rankin, who is the Chair of the Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee. Thank you, um, so Director Rankin. Uh, I don't have anything really to add. We've had this come through uh, Curriculum Instruction Policy Committee and uh, discussed it in the last board meeting as an intro item. Um, I think it would be good if uh, Dr. DeBacker could just kind of briefly summarize for um, folks who may be listening and wondering what this is, but generally uh, we moved it along pretty easily with uh, support and not a lot of questions. So, of course, if anyone has any, please ask. Director Rankin, this is Diane DeBacker, Chief Academic Officer. Uh, there were only two questions asked at introduction. Uh, Director Rivera-Smith asked if we knew the um, racial equity or um, ethnic makeup of the staff of um, the Open Doors program. We do not have that information. That's not information that was available to us. Uh, we do know that they have about 10 and a half staff members. Some of those are full-time, some of them part-time. Um, the second question that was asked was asked by Director Harris about how we could make this more visible on the website. Uh, Director Harris is correct that it takes, a, it takes more than one click to find this on our website. Uh, right now you have to go to academics and then you have to go to uh, high school programs and then option programs. I think those are the three steps. Uh, that's way too many. As our website is redesigned overall for SPS, each division and department has been asked to uh, give feedback as to how we can get to our information quickly. So Director Harris, we will uh, take that into account and uh, try to get something that's uh, more easily available online. And we also know the best way that students find out about this program are through their individual schools, through teachers that have relationships and connections with students and through our counselors. Thank you, Dr. DeBacker. We, uh, Director Rankin, any final comments or questions or can I move to Director Hampson? Go, go ahead, move on, thanks. Thank you, Director Hampson. Uh, no questions, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. No question, just a comment that we are incredibly blessed to have this uh, program in our midst and many other uh, collaborations with the Seattle colleges and I thank them. Thank you, Director Hersey. No additional questions from me, thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. No questions. I am uh, fully in support. Excited about Thank this program. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. 
No questions. Yes, uh, definitely support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. De Becker, I have no questions for you at this time. Thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, looking forward to supporting it. Uh, Ms. Wilson-Jones, uh, roll call, please. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Wolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move to action item number seven. This is BEX 5. Resolution is 2-2020-21-5. Racial imbalance analysis for Kimball Elementary School replacement project. This came to the operations committee on August 13th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board approve resolution 2020-21-5. Dash five, certifying that the proposed Kimball Elementary School replacement project will not create or aggravate racial imbalance as defined by WAC 392-342-025. Dash dash Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We will now move to directors for any final comments or questions for Chief Podesta before we vote. And we'll begin with our operations committee chairperson, Director Mack. Um, uh, I want to recognize the questions about the analysis and that this um, analysis uh, came through ops. We had the conversation around it and, and agree that um, given current state and known information, it's not expected to create a racial imbalance and that um, I'm looking to approve this. There were questions that came through on the overarching project, however, around the community engagement with the community and the building height um, that I just want to elevate. And I'm not sure that we need to have that conversation here, but um, community has raised questions about whether or not uh, the uh, community surrounding um, the school has been adequately engaged around the um, plans for construction. And Mr. Podesta, um, uh, do, do you want to just respond to that at another, another time, Friday memo or something? Um, I, I think we can give a more comprehensive answer in a Friday memo. We have um, heard concerns about the building height from community. Um, the, there's a fairly steep grade in the site that kind of limits the developable area, but we are um, have reached out to community members, are reassessing the design to see if there's any ways to uh, mitigate this. Um, and I think once the product of some of that analysis and conversation is complete, we could um, inform the board in a Friday memo um, you know, who we've talked to and what options we've looked at. Thank you. Um, that's all I, I have. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rivera Smith. Excuse me, Director Rankin. I mean, Director Rivera Smith. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I don't, I don't have any uh, questions or comments about this. I appreciate that. Um, Chief Podesta can look into that um, NDA engagement process so that we can uh, just share that and learn some that there were, there were places where there could have been more engagement done. Thank you. Uh, apologies, Director Rankin, I did skip you. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, no, I had, I know it's, it's on email about building height, um, so I'll just look forward to the Friday memo. Thank you. And I have no questions for you at this time. Thank you to Director Mack for your, your um, the background there. Uh, Ms. Wilson-Jones, uh, roll call vote, please. Director Rankin. Oh, apologies. I, I went out of order. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? 
Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. All right, we'll now move to action item number eight. This is Distressed Schools Grant Award Construction Contract P5121 for bid number B062087 to Western Ventures Construction for the Co-Elementary School Edition Project. This came to the Operations Committee on August 13th for approval. So may I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute construction contract P5121 with Western Ventures Construction in the amount of $5,043,001, including base bid plus alternate number 1A plus Washington State sales tax with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We'll now move to directors for any final comments or questions for Mr. Excuse me, for Chief Podesta before the vote. And we'll begin again with our Operations Committee Chairperson, Director Mack. Uh, yes, this came through operations for um, when we recommended moving forward for approval. Looking forward to continuing to move on this project as we expect the need for capacity when we reopen our buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. All right, we'll begin uh, with Director Hampson. Uh, no questions for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, no questions, but a comment and a huge thanks to our legislators and our staff and our board led reps that go to Olympia and help us snag some of this funding that we desperately need. Thank you, Director Hersey. None for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, no questions, uh, echoing uh, Director Harris's thanks. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. No questions or comments, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no comments or questions for me, just uh, just a sharing uh, gratitude um, as Director Harris has done. Um, so Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call vote, please. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to our final section, board comments. Uh, and before we do board comments this now evening, um, before we do move to those individual director comments, I also want to note that the superintendent, superintendent Juno's evaluation document is posted to the board meeting agenda online. Um, one, uh, today, we'll, because we've been doing alphabetical order for comments and questions, we're going to, I wanted to start um, Backwards, so we'll start with Director Rivera Smith first um, for any uh, final board comments before before we adjourn. Well, thank you. Um, no, I, I appreciate um, today's meeting um, and conversations. I think I speak for a lot of parents when I say it's been a it's been a hard week. Uh, it's beginning to win with the school year. Um, it's definitely not happening um, as we had hoped months ago. That we sort of knew that. The inevitable was that it was going to look different than it does. It's very different as we're in a remote setting, doing our best to reach students and engage with them. And I, I, I just want to give a big shout out to all of our educators who are rolling with it because life as they knew it is different too. This is nobody signed up to be a remote teacher, and they're they're doing their best. And 
I just want to say just so much gratitude for that because you know we think we have a horrible Thunder Day because a lot of them are teaching with students at home, family they're caring for. So it's it's the biggest lift ever, and I don't want that to go in unrecognized. Um, and amongst our essential staff too, who are also you know the people behind the curtain trying to get everything going and making things work. Um, we are testing our adults department like never before. And it's not just the people we hear from, it's the people down at the IT, it's the people answering phones, responding to emails, um, who we just need to really recognize because this this is not, you know, I don't think anyone's pat themselves on the back for it's done and we're good. Because they know there's a lot of corrections to make, a lot of updates, a lot of training, a lot of communications, and this is a process. It's definitely, yeah, it's not going to be um, solved this week or next month. Um, this I just hope that we can show some grace, and I know that some people are doing that, and it's hard when our students are in tears or in frustration. Um, it is the hardest thing. Um, a lot of us on the board are parents, too, so we definitely feel that. And I want, to know, want, want everybody to know that we are here for you to just even to listen, to do what we can to support you. Um, we, we are, I mean, our communications with the district are only going to grow, I believe, uh, with our staff and with the superintendent because we know that we need to improve that if we want to really serve our families. So thank you for um, encouraging us and supporting us through that. I um, I don't know that there's um I don't know what next week's going to look like, but we are working on everything. Please know that we are doing our best here, um, and thank you everybody for um, your patience, grace, and strength. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. Director Rankin. <laughs> Sorry, you said you're going backwards, didn't you? And I just totally um, let that go right past me. Was ready. Um, yeah, I uh, would love to to see or know if we can. I, I'm thinking about that. 25,000, 26,000 login number and how that's only about half of our students. Um, and presumably this is something that's happening, but if it's not, I just wanted to say that I would like to request or, or support looking. I, I know all the logins. I'm assuming, assuming that we're counting those logins through uh, Teams and Schoology and the student ID numbers. I would love to know if there's a pattern in terms of um, demographic information uh economic status a uh, school what school kids are in if there's any kind of um patterns emerge that we can address if it's a communication gap if it's a device gap if it's a, whatever it is um i would just be super interested to see uh you know the breakdown of, of numbers there and kind of where where all that plays out to so we know who's who's connected and who's not um and uh Let's see from, uh, oh, I also um, just in hearing, you know, talking with parents and teachers and, and hearing about what's going, what's going on out there. Uh, I just want to sort of give, <laughs> give big, uh, a big um, uh, shout out to, to kind of everybody involved. Um, I <laughs> overheard uh, Eckstein PE teacher who I'm sure in person is just like the most enthusiastic and warm and welcoming, you know, she was working so hard to be excited and engaged and, and, um, you know, very physical and uh, <laughs> to a, you know, a bunch of grids of students all sitting at their, at their desks. So I just, I really appreciate the extra effort that everybody's putting into working so hard to connect with our students and, um, Knowing that that personal connection is is really tough right now, but it really is critical to um, any success that we're going to have in a remote setting. That I would I feel pretty comfortable saying that it's it's a rare student, although I'm sure they exist, a, a rare student who can just take the information and do their work without feeling like they like they're part of a community, that they're being supported, that they're interacting with their peers and their teachers. Um, and so just like huge shout out to to the ways in which uh, teachers are trying to make that happen and uh, connected to that also. Um, it was it came up in public testimony, so I'm just going to 
bring up again the critical importance, especially um, before it starts to get really rainy, of us pushing and working as much as we can to find creative ways for students to uh, get together and connect in small groups outside um, or in community spaces. And so I'm really looking forward to continuing on pushing and working on that. And I know that there are a lot of people who can't wait to support to support that and participate in that. And that's really exciting. Um, a final kind of request that I think would be helpful from what I'm hearing from the community is in addition to the training that's been provided to educators on different platforms, um, and I know I've asked about this before, but I'm not sure uh, where it has settled, if it's possible, and I would assume uh, librarians would be a good resource for this, and in fact, probably have already done this, and if we could just connect and try to find a good template, if we could get a basic one-page flowchart for families, for students, for teachers who are still struggling with teams and other applications of just a very basic floor of here's where your email is going to be, if a teacher is going to use email or if they're going to use the messenger in Schoology, um, if they're going to email a parent. It, there's just there's so much information coming at everybody right now. I think it would be really, really, really helpful if we could have some one pagers just basic, basic step by step of like where to go. And I know there's videos and that there's other things, but a visual one pager would be, I think, a huge help based on what I'm hearing from particularly parents who are supporting younger students trying to figure out where they should go, where they should direct their student to go. So just putting that out there. But um, yeah, ditto what uh, Director Vera Smith said. Nobody expected this. And uh, I still, even though I know there are a lot of things that are uh, challenges. Um, I am still looking at uh, the opportunities and trying to find the wins in this situation and things that we can learn from and, and continue to do to do better and carry forward. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Mack. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question as a president of uh, an executive committee going forward on um, future agendas for our meetings, even in this remote setting, we've dropped our committee reports. Um, so I'm wondering if those are gonna come back and I don't need an answer right now, but um, just wanted to raise that question uh, because that communication around uh, what's going on in committee, I think is helpful to have at the board meetings as well. Um, I appreciate the comments around how challenging it's been in this first week and uh, having three kiddos myself um, I share that uh, uh, experience, uh, learning new technology, dealing with technology, passwords are the bane of my existence, it drives me crazy, um, and the complicated network challenge that we are dealing with on an individual basis of learning these new systems and how to get connected um, is just magnified by, a, you know, a, a district of 54,000 students and 6,000 educators and it's this is just a massive huge technological rollout um and ramp up that uh I, I don't i don't think any corporation has ever taken this on in this magnitude and so you know i recognize and completely recognize how challenging the entire uh situation is and appreciate how hard everybody is working to um, find solutions for students. And in particular, the um, the focus on social and emotional learning in this first week, while the you know lack of clarity around a full schedule, et cetera, is you know we're getting complaints from people about that. Um, I personally have really appreciated how um, the educators that I've interfaced with are really focusing on connection, um, uh, helping, students to regulate and to you know manage this this new environment i mean doing all of this remotely doing our meetings remotely it's taxing in a in a whole different way um and i've personally had to focus on trying not to become dysregulated because it is it's it is it's just individually very challenging to deal with all this new technology and so a, a massive thank you to everyone who is um keeping cool and and just 
you know, trying to continue solving the problems and support each other. And particularly, uh, a massive shout out to principals and educators who have, you know, taken on the distribution of all these materials um, and the, the devices and all of this. It's just, it's just really massive and in such a short time frame. Um, you know, I just massive kudos and thank you to everyone for for doing the best that we can. And I look forward to continuing to work on ensuring that we have sufficient infrastructure. And I, I appreciate uh, Director Rankin's suggestion around uh, one pagers around best practices. Um, I do think that it could be helpful also to have some, you know, simple best practices of, of you know, here's how to run a remote meeting effectively. Um, and I know maybe some of that stuff has already been floating around, but uh, that that might be helpful as well. And I appreciate the, uh, the suggestion. Um, uh, I also want to highlight that I appreciate that we are continuing to work on student safety and the uh, board resolution that was previously uh, passed uh, a bit ago and that we had a work session on a few weeks ago. And uh, we've uh, been discussing which policies and which through which committees, et cetera. So that work is continuing. And um, I just wanted to to uh, thank you for the support of the amendment there today um, on policy 5253. Um, because, you know, I do feel it's, it's, it's important to remind staff that we must inform, this is already in WAC, that they must inform supervisor administration when bounty violations rise to the level of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. And as future policies come forward to us that we talk about, I'll be seeking to maintain or add policy language to additionally um, support cross-reporting allegations of harassment, intimidation, bullying, and discrimination, and retaliation. The goal that I have for this is that cross-reporting will help systemically to decrease complaint investigation times potentially and ensure the appropriate policies, procedures, and personnel or educational files are reviewed by multiple staff when investigating and evaluating the, um, the allegations. I think that systemically we have some gaps in our accountability and that this is one of the ways in which we can uh, shore that up a bit further for the safety of our students. And um, so I appreciate uh, the work that we did today. Um, I also wanted to share that uh, the WASDA uh, General Assembly is coming up on the 25th, and that's where the entire uh, state votes on um, the WASDA positions. And I wanted to bring to your attention that uh, as I sit on the Legislative Committee and work on um, helping to develop and recommend position statements, to move forward. One of the ones that uh, will be coming that um, uh, I, I supported and, and helped craft um, is uh, one on comprehensive student safety. And just briefly, it states, WASA shall initiate or support legislation to increase and ensure student experience of physical, social, and emotional safety Legislation should include requirements for student voice and policy development, parent notification, increased scope and frequency of staff training, enforcement of student safety requirements, and creation of accountability for all staff and volunteers and provide needed funding. Um, and so I'm, I'm proud to, uh, to have support the development of that. It's coming in front of the full um, body uh, on the 25th. Um, and I still need to, I think we still need to assign the delegate for the voting of that from the Seattle School District, but I'll circle back on that. Um, and um, I think that is all the notes that I had put down of the things I wanted to talk about and um, deep gratitude to everyone and um, sending out all of my uh, patience and support to all of you as I'm trying to instill it in myself as well. Thank you. Director Hersey. Hey, thank you so much for everyone who has put in the work on all of these various pieces. It is greatly appreciated. 
Uh, many of you know we started school today down in Federal Way with fully virtual learning. And I got to say, all things considered, it went off without uh, too many grumbles. <laughs> but what I will say is that as an educator, being back in my classroom and seeing my students' faces and sitting there with their parents and helping them navigate through Zoom and Padlet and so many other resources, it is just a solid reminder that we need to do everything in our power that we possibly can, not only to support our families that are logging on, but even more so to support our families who still do not have a device, who do not speak the language in which all of our materials are written, who do not have access to internet. There are so many various obstacles that our families are facing right now. And as they continue to try and show up to do what's right for their students, the very least we can do is do our part to do the same. So as we are heading into what will be an unprecedented school year across this state, I am really very excited and very, very, I don't even know the word, frankly. I, I am hoping that we as a system can really step up to the plate and continue to do everything that we can to get our students the resources, the technology, and everything else that they need in order to continue to make this a decent and wonderful educational experience because if we do not our students have everything to lose so thank you for all the work that has been going into this so far we can't stop now let's keep pushing forward and i will cede the rest of my time thank you director hersey director harris uh, let me echo the deep gratitude uh let me echo my excitement about alan t sugiyama high school at Southlake, um, and let me echo the frustration of parents and communities with respect to simple, easy to use instructions, whether that's how to log on Teams, whether that's who do I call when I have a problem. Uh, I think some of the website uh, redo will help with that. Uh, been working with Chief Jesse in terms of um, some of that for escalating issues and hope to see that. I think he and I are looking at 915 October 1st. Um, and then the community engagement piece, now more than ever, incredibly important for us to be responsive to our community because they can't see our smiling faces. We can't meet in person and we, we've, truly got to step up our game. I am terrified about losing students from our district, not so much because we lose the money, but because we've lost the trust. And um, I know everybody's working hard. I just hope we can work smarter and more collaboratively. Thank you. Director Hampson. Um, thank you. Uh, we've been going for a while, so I'll try to keep uh, my remarks short. I did want to say um, as part of audit and finance, we've actually completed um, our uh, review, our external review of internal audit, and that will be presented uh, Monday morning at 730 with Moss Adams. Uh, providing that that presentation. I'm really grateful to so many staff people and um, board members who contributed to that. I'm, I'm really um, proud of, of the work that went into that and the collaboration that created that report. I think it's going to be um, uh, an incredibly useful tool and set of next steps to strengthen the role and the collaborative nature of internal audit um, towards better risk management and um, performative uh, audits uh, throughout the, um, the the organization. And so I know uh, Andrew uh, Medina um, and I worked um, uh, very hard on that with um, Moss Adams to make to, to bring that to um, its conclusion. And um, it's probably not exciting to a lot of folks, but I do think that it's an important piece of work that brings 
um, to and into light uh, some work that that has actually been um, kind of just sitting for a while and um, and it, um, represents a new era of of um, of how we operate with um, our internal audit function um, our other our other staff person so um, anyone who wants to tune in, please do. Um, I know it's early. Um, it's a good way to get going on a Monday morning. Um, I um, don't want to go into too much detail about, um, you know, first week of school um, in terms of, of what that's been like. I feel like it's, it's really too early to tell. Uh, I know that the one comment that I've heard is Kind of a sense of of loss um, happy to see each other but a sense of loss in terms of oh you know we're not really going to have any of that um, physical interaction uh, with one another and for that reason i just want to um, re-highlight and underline uh, the um, really hard work that this entire board um, did to along with many 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 community members to put together our resolution on reopening schools um, with the prospects of having community and outdoor pilots in our schools um, and the importance of getting that message out um, and that we should have um, before the board next board meeting our um, board action report on the outdoor learning um, community and outdoor learning task force um, and so that work does continue. And I, I hear um, folks in community who want to see us in, invest in that good work. And I know that we're all committed to doing that because we are seeing already and will continue to see very clearly that our students need more um, than just a computer in order to connect to uh, the development of their intellectual health and to connect to uh, their teachers. There are things that our teachers do for our children that we as parents just simply can't do um, I, I think that was for me in connecting with um, my students um, teacher just that reminder um, was made me really grateful to have um, her back in our lives um, but I know that she's very much desperate and concerned about um, what that's going to look like in a month when when kids um, particularly um, younger kids tire of that remote opportunity and, and haven't developed any other chances. So uh, we really need to work hard at seeing um, at, at the, not just trying to rebuild that brick and mortar, but to um, be creative and to support our staff in our buildings, our, our admins and our um, teaching staff to do things creatively. Um, that's really where I, I hope that we're all um, ready to, to move collaboratively and roll up our sleeves and, and do that work because um, it was hard to get to this reopening. Um, so onward and upward and uh, Pina Gigi to um, everyone for their work and, and getting to this meeting today. I know um, putting these bars together is hard, hard work. Um, and I, I want staff to know that that I do recognize that. Um, and, and we have um, so much more to do. So um, we'll see you all uh, tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, our resolution in June, our commitment to our black students, as well as the work over the summer that Director Mack mentioned. Um, Directors Mack and Director Rankin and myself met, uh, I believe last week to go over policies that were elevated and, and identified and highlighted from the, both that resolution and our work session. And so those policies um, will move out to, to the appropriate committees and so thank you, Director Mack and Director Rankin, for the work um, last week. Um, wanted to also just elevate that last night I had um, my LGBT and LGBT community Zoom meeting. This was our second attempt at this meeting. The first meeting we had, um, we were Zoom bombed uh, with really harassing, homophobic, transphobic, racist remarks. Um, and so we had, to, we had to build in a lot more safety and security measures to ensure that we had a safe, uh, an inclusive and welcoming um, Zoom call yesterday. So I think, if anything, I want to elevate the lengths by which we have to take to keep some of our students safe in our district. And I, you know, call out the parents and the families that don't, um, that aren't raising their children to be more respectful and kind to others that are different than them. 
Um, I have a, a, a list of, of items that were raised by both students and families on last night's call, and I'll compile those and, and send those to Superintendent Juneau and the appropriate um, staff for just some follow-up and then questions as a, as a commitment I made to the folks on that call yesterday. So thank you to them. Thank you to the families that helped organize that, the Masners from my district, as well as the Seattle Council PTSA for helping to organize that as well. Um, and I look forward to future opportunities to connect with community. Um, I wanted to give one final reminder about tomorrow. Our reopening update work session for this week is focused on attendance and schedules. And so we will be discussing those topics tomorrow at three o'clock. Um, and you can find the information uh, where to dial in and listen to the conversation on our website. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you to staff for all of your hard work. I know you're working hard uh, as we reopen and so grateful to all of you. Um, there being no further business to come before the board tonight, the regular board meeting is now adjourned at 5.31 p.m. Thank you all and I will see you tomorrow at our work session. Thank you. Thank you.